uh, next speaker is Roger Curran, but Roger was complaining to me that uh, everybody's already said what he wanted to say, so we'll go straight on to, oh no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not only has everyone said, but now you have said what I was going to say. <laughs> so they say, when you're the seventh speaker in, uh, in a seminar on, uh, on the three R's, it, it really is, and especially following uh, uh, Julia, where uh, a number of things that we're going to talk about are, are similar. Uh, starting out with the fact that uh, the, uh, the density of, of the principles of humane experimental technique that J Julia mentioned, some of the paragraphs are extremely difficult, and I always thought I had a good vocabulary, but I've never heard the word adumbrate before, uh, and I found adumbrate for the first time in, uh, in, the three, uh, in, uh, in Bill Russell's uh, book. So let me come to my place. Uh, it's not touch screen. I needed to use it. Great, thank you. So I'm trying to take us on a little trip through uh, the first part of 3R's activities. Uh, I'm going to bring up some things that are high points to me, and many of them have already been mentioned, but I'm going to try and extract from those high points, not necessarily what we learned, but the process that was involved in doing that. So even though the finding may be even somewhat trivial, uh, the background of how we got there was interesting. Uh, and I'll try and put a little humor into it now and again, so try and laugh when I do. Uh, <laughs> so as we start on the, the journey, we'll look at mile zero as being uh, when the publication of the principles came out in 1959. And just the first half step on this is, is something I had noticed in that others have, have uh, sort of uh, described, uh, which was there was an, the book wasn't received very well in, in many cases. But, and some of you know, I've been trying to collect copies of the, the principles, been doing that for the last 25 years or so. And one of the copies that I was able to purchase online uh, actually came from the library of a extremely large personal care product company in the, in the United States. It was in the library according to normal library procedures back there, what, back then when you, you actually had a card in the back of it, you signed your name on it and then it was dated and so everybody, know, you know, there was no privacy here, everybody could, <laughs> could find out what books you had read. And it was interesting, uh, the library received the book in January 1960, so it was right after the publication and interestingly enough, uh, it was checked out seven times in the first seven months, which I thought was actually a fairly high number of reads for a strange new book like this. <laughs> now why, I've speculated many times that the first people will read it and say, oh, this is so great, we're gonna tell everybody else about it and then they don't have to read it. Or did they say, Oh, this is going to spoil my laboratory activities and I'm going to tell everybody else not to read it. But there's a lot of speculations and I think it was some sort of an interesting finding. Let's look at what things were like back in 1960 and in 70 and in 80. We'll be practical about this. This is what we're looking at many times. We're looking at a hugely disformed rabbit eye uh, from an eye irritation test or huge burns on the animal's back from a skin irritation test. So these, these aren't theoretical things that we're talking about. These are actually harms that are occurring to the animals. So in um, 1992, 33 years past the first principles, I visited a pharmaceutical company and I was shown five years of Dre's data in the old printouts that Andrew was talking about this morning, a stack probably eight inches high 
which contained testing that had been done on compound after compound, very closely related over five years, the scores averaging 90 on a Dray scale. Now, those of you who, most of you know the scale is zero to 110, so 90 is a severe damage. And the company just wanted to have records of what every one of their pharmaceutical intermediates was without any thought of the, essentially, the morality of, of doing this. Um, essentially the same compound tested in different batches year after year after year. But at least now we have made some progress, and in 2019, at least for non-animal OECD test guidelines uh, for most portions of the eye irritation spectrum and several others. So the replacement R has begun to arrive. And of course, this I said strange, but this is really interesting bedfellows, and again, it goes back to something Julia would just say, and we'll look at this more as we go through the presentation. The people working together um, make interesting bedfellows. What's my first point, or the second point maybe on the milestone, was uh, the famous study by Wheel and Scala about eye irritation and, and wondering what this test actually showed us. On uh, the famous, infamous table 12 of Wheel and Scala showed what happened when you gave, what is it, uh, nine, I think, nine different chemicals to 24 different laboratories and asked them to perform eye irritation testing on it. Um, and these were generally six rabbit tests, so it shows you that, for example, in this laboratory, uh, chemical A scored as low as eight or as high as 27. In this laboratory, G, one rabbit was eight, another was completely at the top of the scale. So if one looks at testing chemical A in 24 laboratories, one rabbit could have been zero, another would have been 100. Chemical G, zero to 110. The complete range of irritancies were showing up in, this, in these laboratories. So this, this was one of the first areas where we needed to, the concept of understanding the validity, and here I mean validity and knowing all kinds of concepts about it, of any assay that we were trying to replace, before we replace it. And this led on to some more sophisticated studies le later on, Leon Bruner, Mark Chamberlain, and myself doing, or Leon for the most part, doing the modeling of what things like the Dray's test look like in the middle areas. And we've come to know what we have. So maybe we shouldn't try and replace these tests at all. Maybe, we, as has often been said, maybe we should just ask the question, we're worried about human eye irritation. What things do we need to know to figure out what might be human eye irritants? And then, as Alan was showing earlier, we have a, a fairly major thing happening in 1980 with Henry Spira and the advertisement in the New York full-page ad in the New York Times, leading to extensive funding from the cosmetics industry and then the establishment of the Rockefellers, CAT, and so forth. Why is this important to me? One person can make a difference. This wasn't a whole organization, many people putting this. This is one guy who wanted to do something and wanted to have his voice heard, could be a woman who wanted to have her voice heard, could be just people. And we can make a difference if we yell loud enough. The, one of the next significant things was uh, the beginning of cat workshops that were going on here. Uh, and I have to admit, um, although the talks were good, at the, at the, I didn't pay that much attention to the speakers. When you went to the poster sessions, this was one of the first times that you could actually have good scientific arguments, discussions at the posters with people. And I thought that was by far the most valuable activities here. And I think most people who were there, it, it broadened the field of people who were, who were looking at it. And now, of course, this is broadened out into the World Congresses. Uh, we're in the 11th incarnation of this, and the points that I want to make here is that this going to the world congresses uh, brought the concept of international activities as important. And this is always should be kept in mind. Trade is international. Well, some political pundits may not think that, but we'll say it is. And manufacturers may actually reject using non-animal methods if any one of their customers, customers being foreign countries, 
have a requirement for animal testing. Why do an in vitro test when you know you're going to have to do the animal tests for company or for country C? Uh, you can just do that animal test and then give the results to everybody else. So it's, we have to be changing the world as we go in a practical method as we go forward. One of my next uh, markers on the milestone uh, was the formation of ATLA. And we've had several er, of frame and ATLA. We've had several uh, discussions of that, but it became, I look at the journal as being a safe haven for radical thoughts. Michael can write very radical, interesting uh, uh, commentaries, and people can either say, hey, that's great, or, wow, what a bunch of crap, or maybe I should think about it, and that's the important one. Maybe I should, I haven't thought that way before, maybe I should think about it. So I think. The finding here is that we need to maintain and encourage scientific societies and forums, or fora, where constructive criticism can move the best science forward. And that's actually happened in Europe for quite a while. Uh, here, I'd like to think of Christy and, and Aaron forming the American Society for uh, Cellular and Computational Toxicology as being a, a big point. We finally have a society here in the US, and we need to continue to do these things. ECVAM was formed in 1993, and uh, maybe we're up to mile 0 0.08 at this point. Uh, the, the various workshops that were held, and then the publications that came out, the publications were probably good. I'm sure some people read them. The workshops themselves to have been participants in them from where the, I think there was a, a nice selection of people being brought together at ECFAM to discuss cogently some of the uh, problems that existed and the ways forward, then to drink some wine, then to have more discussions of how to do it, brought a number of people together face to face that was very important and I think that needs to continue. Oops, I didn't have my conclusion on that one. Um, and I happened to put out uh, just the pre-validation study as being one of the uh, approaches that we can use trying to use fairly simplistic methodology to come to a conclusion and that it isn't always necessary to have 57 laboratories, 275 chemicals and so forth and that you can uh, uh, apply something like the pre-validation concept uh, even today to many of the areas that we're talking about. Uh, I'd just be remiss if I didn't say that IIVS was founded in 1997, that we've done a lot, I think. We've tried to supplement some of the things that CAT has done and be able to combine uh, to help the field to grow and mature. Um, yeah, so a, a bad slide. IRAG, uh, which many people have forgotten right now, was, it was an activity uh, by the regulatory community to try and put together, to say almost prove to us that alternative methods or replacement methods really have some validity. And that was going to require that they ask industry to come forward with data on animals, data on in vitro subjects that had been previously extremely tightly held confidential within the, and most of the companies started out saying, why would I put my data out in the public field? Why would I, uh, why would I share it with a regulatory agency? So we were able to, to, to put boundaries around this to code a lot of industry, the majority of industry data and to use them in a combination to actually look in the detail about how the assays were working. Now, the fact that industry finally got the trust to do this is the important point and was one of the first indications of industry, government working together to uh, come forward uh, with uh, an activity that actually moved the field forward. That was industry and government. One of the first really positive activities for working with animal welfare in a very constructive way uh, happened in 1998. A number of companies were uh, using for eye irritation uh, methodology the bovine cornea method, which involves excising a, a 
using a, a cornea from a um, uh, cattle that were being uh, used in slaughter for, for food production. And it was being accepted by some of the regulatory agencies. But many companies came to us and said, we'll never do this test because if we do this test, PETA will be at our doorstep, we're using animals, uh, this will be horrible, I don't care if it does save animals, we're going to continue to use the rabbit test because there's nothing new there and go on from there. This just didn't make sense. So we actually talked with PETA and with Ingrid Newkirk and said, does this make sense that, that we can't use this non-animal assay because you're going to be at their doorstep with a rabbit costume on uh, and go to their board meeting? So in a very pragmatic way, she came out with a statement, a written statement that we could hand out to various companies that said, if you use the bovine, we don't like the fact that people kill cattle for meat, but if you're going to save some animals for doing this and it's going to go on anyway, you can you can safely do this test. We will not pick at the companies. We will not bring any harm to the companies that do this, as long as you look at it as a stepping stone towards a complete reduction. So I'm going to have almost the same statement as I had before, but when industry and animal welfare work together, the opportunity for real change occurs, but not easily achieved. We're going to expand it a little bit more. Uh, Several years ago, uh, there, there's sort of an interesting um, a phenomenon about, about the regulations of EPA. Uh, if you have many household products, uh, if it's just a regular household product, a cleaning product, you really don't have to uh, provide data to anyone about uh, the, the safety of this product. And people have been in products like this have been in use for years, the Windex that you spray on your windows, of, the, the uh, cleaner that you use on your, your tabletop have been in safe use for many years without a required animal testing. And most of the companies who make these products do, it with, do the testing with in vitro methods. But if you make this little claim, and this has become very sort of important lately, that the product is antimicrobial, then the product becomes a pesticide under the regulations. So you don't have a nice cleaning product. You have a, you know, a full-blown dangerous material uh, that has to have the six-pack assay uh, from the EPA before it gets registered. This was brought up by Animal Welfare at one of the uh, science advisory meetings for the EPA. They said, can't we do something about this? Because we know these products are generally safe. Uh, industry said, yeah, that's a good idea for us. We don't really want to do it. Uh, and the government said, you know, what the heck, we don't really want to do this to things for Windex just because it says antimicrobial on it. Uh, so with an agreement between the, the three groups working together, uh, there was a major study done that led to, uh, which I have facilitated, the first non-animal integrated testing strategy approved for use of the, by the US EPA. So it's actually with the first study that was, went through, and you can use this process. Now, sadly, we found out later, going back to about six slides ago, that people who make these products also sell them in country X overseas. Country X requires animal testing. So now, why go to the extra struggle of doing the in vitro test? So the, the process is not being used very much because the companies know that they have to do an animal test to supply, to satisfy country-wise requirements and it's extra money to spend. But many of the more ethical companies do do this work. We have to have crusaders, and there are many crusaders in this room, uh, but I'd just like to honor Bjorn Ekwall. Uh, like many others, he was a crusader uh, he made strong speeches. He irritated a lot of people. Uh, you would always get cornered in the side of the room. Uh, he continually stirred the pot, is a phrase that we often use. In 1999, he visited us at IAVS and, and brought a six pack of uh, Aquavit from Sweden. And he said, when we were, you know, when we finally get rid of the acute systemic toxicity test with an in vitro test, I'll come back and we'll, we'll drink this stuff uh, together. Well, sadly, he died the, the next year. Uh, but I still have, uh, it, there's a lot of dust on it right now, but I still have the container. And just to 
a, a, um, a warning here. I guess I'm, I'm starting something a little bit early, but I have something that's going to be supplied to something that Tomas will talk about in a, in a few minutes. I'm glad to donate this to a time capsule that will come out and that we can have it someday. So we need, we need crusaders. Um, actually, spies are helpful, too. So <laughs> if you can go to another country and garner some of their secrets and bring it back, that, that, that works better for anything else. Uh, for those of you who don't, I can't, I can't reveal the person's name. Initials MS, but I... <laughs> or you can even do more egregious activities of trying to steal secrets from a zip at uh, uh, Canva or, or uh, 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 assay demonstration by Horst and Manfred. Uh, so trying to find out from the back row what's actually going on. <laughs> Dirty tricks are all right. <laughs> Ekbam. Uh, and now Cat, under Thomas's uh, reign, uh, is another high point for instituting retrospective review. And this was a, um, sort of using many of the concepts of, um, of, of uh, uh, evidence-based medicine and evidence-based toxicology to look at past information from uh, assay systems and being able to uh, quantify this and bring it together to, in a way that can actually uh, be helpful. And this actually led to um, a test which was uh, on the cover of Science in 1989 uh, by 2009 being actually uh, suggested by ECFAM as a, as a useful assay for acute systemic uh, uh, toxicity. Uh, once again, it's not the product that's important here because this assay as the machines have died, we can't buy one on eBay anymore. Uh, but it's the process that got here that should be retained and remembered and, and used in the, in the future. So don't be afraid of new approaches, that, for example, that Thomas, Thomas was uh, professing. Uh, but it was somewhat also rooted in the past and that's also good. So now we've gone from those areas where we're struggling, we have processes that are good, and now we're looking at tests being re, uh, of extreme importance in other countries, uh, of very much interest internationally. This is one of the training sessions where, that Aaron has, has headed up in China and uh, in which we've worked with other, with animal welfare organizations. Uh, there's just a giant thirst for knowledge about new tests. Now in countries like China, uh, they actually approach it like we're starting to do now. Uh, animal welfare is not a driver at all, but using new technologies, using the best technologies, important technologies, is, is the driver for these things. So I'd like to give a short admonition to paraphrase Ruth Bader Ginsburg's rebuttal to when the Supreme Court was discussing dropping certain preclearances that were required of various states before they to do voting registration. Uh, and then I've paraphrased it a bit here, throwing out previous learnings to make the bumpy road to replacement a thoroughfare. And now, as Ginsburg said, it's like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Well, yes, of course it's protecting you. You're not getting wet. Don't throw the umbrella away because you will get wet. All right. so. Let's not throw away all of our learnings from past studies uh, just because we haven't had a problem so far. So to conclude, I'd just like to go back to this next slide again, which Julia brought up several times. It's the working of industry, various organizations, regulators, animal welfare. As a group together, a lot of progress can be made and can continue. Thank you.